we'll make sure my mic is on. Am I on up there, fellas? Oh, thank you. Good morning. Check, check, check. Frank, can that go up? How about now? You're up all the way. Okay, well, let's go yellow mic then. How to use a mic and you put it in your shirt like I just did and now you yeah. have to undo it <laughs> we're gonna leave it there okay. all right we'll go 17 all right nice to see you all and good morning um, it's nice to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to preach Bill thank you for preaching last week and uh, for bringing the word to us and sharing. And uh, Pastor Steve should be back next week um, from his, uh, with Sheila from their vacation with their uh, family. Um, so, I, and, and where's Rich? Rich, I really appreciate your, um, you know, your prayer and, and praying for our um, uh, folks who gave their lives as we celebrate Memorial Day and remember on Memorial Day and our, our thankfulness to them and their families for that sacrifice, um, and also your uh, heartfelt prayer for the people in, in Texas and just the horror of even uh, unimaginable what's, what's going on there. Um, what I want to talk about today, and, and we're going to watch a short video in a second, but before, I just wanted to just read a little scripture. And I, what I hope to do today is take um, our relationship with God and our relationship with each other and simplify it down into, the, into one word, and that word is love. And Jesus did the same thing. And if we have that scripture, it's Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. And it says, Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And this is a great, I'm, I'm going to pause for one second. He had the opportunity here to go through the list. Don't do this. Don't do that. You better do this. You better do that. And you know what he said? Jesus replied, verse 37, two things. That's all you have to remember. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Number two is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law, all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So, short video here, if we could play that here. This is actually from the, a little clip from The Chosen. Jesus talking about love. I speak of what I know and have seen. And it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more with them before you are silenced. I have come to the world and speak words, Nicodemus. Miracles. Yes. But even more than that, do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They were to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then they were bitten by serpents and they were dying. But, but God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the brown serpent in the desert and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. And from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. He gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about 
sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? So, I'm going to summarize it. I know it was a little hard to see and hear. Um, but basically what he's talking about here is the idea that um, God's love for us is eternal and has to deal with eternal implications. Nicodemus and most of his, Jesus' friends at that time were concerned about worldly matters. If you heard what he, one thing Nicodemus brought up were taxes. Who likes, no one likes paying taxes. Even then, 2,000 years ago, they were worried about taxes, right? What did Jesus say about taxes in another situation? Give to Caesar what's for Caesar and give to God what is for God, right? Remember, Jesus and his disciples lived in an oppressed situation. They had occupiers in their land, godless, according to them, godless occupiers defiling their faith, forcing them to live a certain way. And his disciples and his friends on Palm Sunday wanted a military revolution. They wanted to kick the oppressors out. And Jesus said in this clip, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to worry about eternity and to save everyone who believes eternally. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about love in two different, two different circumstances today. But first, let me tell you a quick story um, about a man and sort of how um, uh, this person went through uh, just a tremendous amount of, of difficulties and struggles, and you could say was dealt a difficult hand. So this man um, had a very difficult time of things in life. He was uh, basically born into the, what would be considered the bottom of the human hierarchy at the time he was born. Um, as far as status and success, he was born into deep poverty. Uh, he was born illegitimately, meaning his parents weren't married. His mom was a teenager um, when he was born. He found himself in life um, having some successes and then also being uh, turned on and betrayed and lied about and all those sorts of things. Um, he, he was considered an outcast at one point. He was picked on, mocked, um, and even physically beaten, um, harassed, spit on, etc. He found himself even running into some difficulties with the authorities. He was arrested at one point in his life. Um, and it can even be uh, argued whether it was just or unjust. Um, if you haven't figured out who I'm talking about, it's Jesus. Right? Um, and despite all this, this is God's son <clears throat> that he sent to save the world who went through all of those difficulties. One thing I want to talk about related to that is poverty. Now, Jesus certainly was born into, um, uh, you know, an impoverished situation, you know, meaning basically everyone who lived at that time, uh, unless you were at the very top, were, were living in difficult uh, situations. But here's, I want you to think about something a little bit different. We think of poverty as a lack of money, a lack of resources, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus was, you know, as it says um, in Isaiah 53, 3, Jesus was despised. The Messiah would be despised and rejected. It said he would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest of grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and no one cared. So what I want to just talk about, too, is poverty. So yes, Jesus was born in an impoverished situation financially and monetarily and all that sort of stuff and his status, but he also suffered poverty in a different way. Um, a, a study was done now in, in the 2000s of people who were classified as poor all over the world, not just the United States, but all over the world. And they said, how would you define poverty? Not 
this is the list of things they came up with, and almost none of them listed, we don't have enough money. We don't have this. We don't have that. You know what they listed as? Shame, inferiority, powerlessness, humiliation, fear, hopelessness, depression, voicelessness, social isolation. So when we say Jesus was poor, he was, he was born into poverty, he was rejected, he was despised, not only did he suffer the physical pain of the cross, he also suffered these other things. Because he was, as it says in Isaiah, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. I don't know about you, if you has anyone ever watched The Passion of the Christ? Especially the, the it's rough. It's rough, right? It's rough to watch. Um, I find not only is the violent part rough to watch, the rejection part is rough to watch. It's rough to watch someone I care about, Jesus, be rejected, hit, spit upon, called names, killed for, for each of us. So when we talk about love, God's love for us, and Jesus even said it in that uh, clip that you couldn't see, um, the fact that God himself would send his son to our world to, to suffer in poverty, both monetary, monetarily, but also those other things, isolation and depression and um, uh, humiliation and rejection and being despised and all that sort of stuff. This is an act of love beyond comprehension. This makes no sense to human beings. And um, this is not normal love. This is love that we are called to understand that this is how much God loves us, that his own son, for those of you who have children, um, think about putting your own child through this for people who have rejected you, for people who don't agree with you, right? It says Romans 5.8, one of my favorite verses. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we are still sinners. Not once we're perfect, because guess what? Then he's not coming, is he? He's never sending a son if he's waiting for us to be perfect. We don't have to wait till we're perfect before we can appreciate God's uh, love for us. So, you know, love is a word that's thrown around very casually, including with myself, in our culture, in the English language. We talk about, I love what I had for dinner last night. I love the weather today. Michaela mentioned it. She's correct. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's comfortable. The sun is out. We love what's, you know, that, that movie we saw. We love the result of that football game, you know, whatever it is. It's thrown around. The Greek language, the language of the New Testament, actually has several different words of, for love. And you may have heard some of this before. Um, but it helps to understand God's love for us. So the first Greek word is storge, S-T-O-R-G-E. And that's just simply affectionate love, familial love. You love your family. Um, you're, you know, you're comfortable in that love, um, S-T-O-R-G-E. Eros, you may have heard of, is more romantic love. Um, philia, P-H-I-L-I-A, is friendship love. So even in the Bible, that word is used that Christians should, should love each other, philia, in that sort of way, this fellowship, this bond between people. You, you have similar interests and similar desires, and you have this uh, philia. And then, of course, and I'm sure most of you have heard about this, is agape love. And agape in Greek is the love that is unconcerned with ourselves and concerned with the greatest good for another. God was unconcerned with himself when he sent his son to go through that for us. And that's something we have to convince ourselves of, that there's nothing we can do to make God or to, to earn God's love more than he already has shown us that. Um, it's, it's not, agape love is not just emotions, but it's actually a, um, uh, a choice. It, it, it's a faithful choice it's a commitment, and it's a sacrifice without expecting anything in return. So Jesus paid that price for us 
the free gift for our salvation. As a matter of fact, in the, uh, the New Testament, the word agape is used over 200 times just in the New Testament. So this special kind of love is um, it's a transcendent love. It's, a, it's the highest form of love. It's something that s- makes our relationship with God extraordinarily special. It should boost our self-esteem in a way that we can't even describe. If we worry about, um, you know, our status with God, or, oh, wow, I shouldn't have done that, or I wish I did this, and we make mistakes, does God love us any less? Of course not, um, because of this agape love. So it is the highest form of love, um, uh, and, and so forth. So let me tell you a quick story. Um, This is a story about uh, a priest in Detroit whose name was Father Edward Farrell, and he went to Ireland to visit his relatives uh, for vacation, and one morning he woke up early, went with his his uncle, and walked down to the lake to watch the sunrise, and they stood there for 20 minutes in silence, just taking in the beauty of the day and the morning and the sunrise, and as they started to leave, Father Ed noticed that his uncle was smiling. They hadn't said a word to each other, just smiling really broadly. So he asked him, you know, what what are you so happy about? And his uncle replied, the father of Jesus is very fond of me. The father of Jesus is very fond of me. Those are really profound words. Because here's a question for all of you. I won't make you raise your hand or comment on live stream if, unless you want to. But are you, do, you, do I really believe, do you really believe that God likes you? Or is he just mad? Do you really believe that God really likes you? Or is he disappointed? So my, I'm trying to, con- my convince, I'm trying to convince you and me through scripture <laughs> that um, he not only likes us, but he agape loves us, right? Now, I think any Christian would say, of course God loves me, right? What's the song we, we learned in Sunday school when you were four? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. There you go, done, right? But does, is he fond of you? Is he fond of me? And I hope that you see that even in the video clip you couldn't see, when they were, Jesus' friends wanted him to be the king, to revolt, to throw the Romans out and be at the highest status in that society. He wanted nothing to do with it, right? And you know what his choice was? Fight and be the king or die on a cross, and be the king for real. There you go. Exactly. Be the eternal king. So um, let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. It says, Can a mother, think about God's love for us. Can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? Even if that were not a possible, if that were not, if that were possible, God says, I would not forget you. So he is not only fond, he's, he loves you, but he's also fond of you. Let me read two from Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Something to remember tomorrow morning when you wake up, if the sun is out or even if it's cloudy. Think about this guy over in Ireland who was, con- who was smiling broadly because God, the father of Jesus, was fond of him. I think that love is the essence of Christianity. Jesus himself boiled down when he was asked, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You can sum up literally the Old Testament and the New Testament um, in those verses. Love the Lord your God with, um, with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor uh, as yourself, Matthew 22. Um, and because of this, 
We have hope. We have the brightest of futures waiting for us in eternity where there's no more suffering, no more death, no more tears, no more pain, and also no more shame, no more sadness, no more depression, no more isolation, all those other things uh, that I listed. So that's part one. God is, is not, only, not only loves us enough to die for us, but he's fond of you. Now, let's t- that's, that is sort of the easy part. This is the hard part. The second part is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's very easy to sort of gloss over that and go, oh, yeah, you know, the guy next door, when he pulls out his driveway, I wave, you know. Yeah, he's, I'm fine with him. We don't argue. You know, his dog doesn't go on my lawn. And, or if they do, they pick it up. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's easy. But you know what? That agape love applies here also. And this is where it gets tricky. Um, because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how are we supposed to love ourselves? The way God loves us. Exactly. So we know that God loves us, and that love is different. It's not this, this earthly, casual love. It is a love um, that is beyond human understanding. And it's not a feeling. It's a motivation for action. Right? It's a choice. Agape love you can choose or reject. It's sacrificial. It voluntarily chooses inconvenience, discomfort, even death for the benefit of another person without expecting anything in return. So let me say that again. So agape love that we are called to, to love others, is sacrificial, voluntarily suffers inconvenience. The other person is put first. You suffer, uh, you voluntarily accept discomfort. And even death for the benefit of another without expecting anything in return. So Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is how uh, Jesus sacrificed himself for us through this agape love and what, what we are called to love others um, the same way. It doesn't make sense. It's the opposite of what we, the world tells us to do, right? Galatians 5, verse 14 says the whole law can be summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law can be summed up with one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's where it gets challenging. I'm supposed to love that guy whose dog does go on my lawn and doesn't pick it up? Or I'm supposed to love that person I work with who voted a certain way I don't think is right? I'm supposed to love that person? Wait, I'm not only supposed to love that person, I'm supposed to sacrifice myself? I'm supposed to give up my own comfort for that person? But they voted for this person. They have a bumper sticker on their car. What are you? I read their social media posts. How could I I give in to that person? I I need to show them I'm right. Right? Isn't that the most important thing? They're wrong and I'm right? Right? So we're supposed, and obviously I'm kidding, um, um, we're called to do one thing, love each other, right, as he loved us. You know the song, um, they'll know we are Christians by what? Is that true? Right? I think last time I preached, which was in September, I'm sure you have all that in your notes right there, uh, <laughs> where, where uh, we talked about this right? How the, you know, surveys show, how does the rest of the world view Christians? We could argue and say that's not right and shame on them and it's the media and all this stuff. But if that's what the world thinks, perception is reality. And it's up to us to live differently to make sure that they see someone different, right? They look at Christians and say, you're judgmental, you're angry, all you're doing is yelling at people to change, uh, live the way you you say to live, all this sort of stuff, um, instead of 
they'll know you are Christians by your love. They'll know you're Christians by your love. Um, so Jesus called us in all of his teaching to do things that are so contrary to human experience and contrary to the way our world tells us to live. Turn the other cheek? What? That's insane. No, no offense. <laughs> Am I right? Is that what the world tells us? Of course not. But that's how people will see Jesus because they'll, they'll say, why didn't you hit them back? You had the ability to hit them back. What did Jesus say when his disciples were encouraging him um, when he was hanging on the cross? He said, I could call down, he had the ability to call down armies of angels and take care of that. And he didn't. Right? We're told to walk the extra mile, even if it's not fair. We're told to, offer not, to not offer resistance. Right? We're taught we're talk to... Uh, reconcile those that we have issues with, we disagree with, to forgive. How many times are you supposed to forgive? 70 times 70, which is how much? Someone, someone calculate that. Can we say a lot? <laughs> 7 times 7, 49, a couple zeros. Is it 49, zero, zero, or 40? I shouldn't be doing math in my head on live stream, but well, anyways, it's a lot. But listen, here's the thing. Whatever that number is, when you get to the end, you're not, that doesn't mean now you stop, right? It's a, it's a rhetorical, you know, you keep going. It's, it's, it's just uh, mean you should forgive and forgive, forgive. Now, imagine if he said at the Sermon on the Mount when he was at, Jesus was encouraging all of these things, right? Telling us this is how we're supposed to live as followers of him. Turn the other cheek, walk, walk the extra mile. Give, if someone demands your, your, you know, this, you give them that and something else. All these, all these things. Imagine if he said, um, you know, not just, here's your command, turn the other cheek. What if he said, it would be good if you turn the other cheek, but, you know, I understand if that person uh, said something really mean on social media or the dog went on your lawn or what? Can you imagine? He said, turn the other cheek. So this, these are new commandments and new ways to live. It's agape love. It's unconditional love. This is what fulfills God's command. This is what's really hard. Pastor Steve talks all the time about um, giving things up as a Christian, that you give up your rights to yourself. This is the hard stuff, right? This is the hard stuff. Loving someone who said that, who I know is wrong, right? Um, and, this, you know, Jesus showed love in lots of different examples. He fed 5,000, right? That he took mercy on, the Bible says. He never once said, why didn't these people plan better? Shame on them. What are they doing out here without food, Right? I take protein bars with me everywhere, so I, you know, I, I agree with that. But he never said that. He forgave the thief on the cross next to him. Right? He healed people. And it's interesting to think about how Jesus would be treated in, today's, in, our, in our culture today or in our world today. Right? How would someone be looked upon, a leader of a church, let's say, who's going around washing people's feet, that's, that's not my favorite thing. That I can tell you that right now, right? Washing people's feet. How about crying in public? That's ruined politicians, right? If you're, if you're old enough to remember, there was, there was a, a politician who was running for vice president who, who cried, done. We don't want this guy anywhere near public office. So imagine weeping in public, washing people's feet. He rode a donkey instead of a horse where he could have been a warrior, right? He forgave his enemies instead of fighting them. He told people to put their swords away. He had the fence, right? One guy used it, and he told them to put it away. So think about how Jesus is, is calling, how he showed his love for us with his sacrifice that the very people who crucified him, he forgave. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Right? As he was on the cross. 
And he calls us to live um, in that same way, that we can carry our truth as Christians and our convictions without destroying people, right? We can carry our truth and our convictions without destroying people. Disagreeing with other people never justifies destroying another person or humiliating another person. I would argue that one of the most effective means of sharing your faith is humility because that's what Jesus did. I don't think that I think humility goes much further in exemplifying how Christ lives, lived for us, and how he lived than trying to shout someone down or argue someone into the kingdom of heaven. And if we can repent of hating our enemies, cruelty, self-righteousness, entitlement, it would shock the world. It would shock the world. And people would say, there is something wrong with those people. And you know what? There is. It's because we're Jesus freaks. We were talking before. Um, we have a friend who went to the Dominican with us from Missouri. And his nickname is Jesus Jeff. Right? And if your nickname is Jesus Jeff, you're, you're living right. And you know what? I think the guy is, I think half of Kansas City makes fun of him. And the other half knows that this guy's got his... Because pe people were just making fun of him for it, right? Because he's a different kind of... He's different because he's living for Jesus. So we are called to embrace a more humble, gracious, servant approach to people inside these walls and outside these walls. And that's how we move our faith forward. That's how, um, that's how the, the kingdom of God expands, for sure. Um, let me read a couple scripture, and we'll wrap up if the praise band wants to... How's that? Pretty good, huh? Praise band wants to come up? I wish I... I I'm glad I thought of that. <laughs> so let's read from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Here we go. The Lord's servant... A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. He must be able to teach and be patient with dif difficult people. Wow. This was fun a few minutes ago. <laughs> now not so fun. 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 18. Even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will, re will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, believer, always be ready to explain it. Do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. And let me end um, with John 13, 34. Jesus is saying, so now... I'm giving you a new commandment. This is, these are our marching orders. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that um, you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit now. We thank you for the agape love that you showed each of us, that while we were still sinners, you died on the cross. You suffered. You were humiliated. You, you were um, beaten and, and killed for each of us. And we thank you for that sacrificial love for us. Lord, we pray that we would um, recognize the immensity of your love for us. No matter what stage of our relationship we are in with you, we pray that you would just um, work in us and change us to seek you with everything we have. We pray that you would help us, Lord, 
to love others around us, especially the difficult ones. Lord, especially those that it's so hard. We pray that you would just help us to, uh, to be different, to love others as you have loved us. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.